Welcome to Italics, television for the Italian American experience. I'm your host, Anthony Tamburri. On this episode of Italics, Dr. Joseph Shore will interview B.G. Firmani about her grandfather, Marino Auriti, who created in the 1950s the Encyclopedic Palace. Let's join them now. Welcome, BG. Um, we're so excited to have you back here at Calandra, even if it's in a virtual mode. I'm so happy to be here and thank you for the invitation. I love talking about my grandfather. Yeah, so for those uh, viewers who don't know, um, BG Fermani is the author of Time's a Thief. It was published in 2017, and we had the great privilege of having BG present the book at the Calandra Institute last year as part of our Writer's Read series. But now we're going to kind of shift gears a little bit um, in terms of the Writer's Read to have... Uh, BG, talk a little bit more about her grandfather, Marino Auriti. Auriti is the uh, creator of the Palazzo Encyclopedico, the encyclopedic palace um, that he created in his town in Pennsylvania in the uh, 1950s, and you are his granddaughter. I grew up thinking everybody, when you wanted to visit your grandparents, you visited something like the Encyclopedic Palace. I just thought that's what your grandparents had. You know, you had this beautiful garage where you went in and you saw this amazing thing. It seemed normal to me, it didn't seem odd. It was only when I got older when I realized that was really unusual. My family, uh, my mother was an artist. She actually went to school for architecture because I think my she was trying to do what my grandfather hadn't been able to do. He had a fourth grade education. He was mostly self-taught. He did study with his parish priest in Guardia Grele. So he was born in Abruzzo in a town called Guardia Grele. And that's known actually for its um, wood making art as well as uh, smithing. I'm gonna say um, copper smiths, iron smiths. Uh, so it's a sort of like an artisan town from the way it's framed. And it's in the province of Chieti, I saw. Yeah, Chieti. Have you been? It's really beautiful. I was many decades ago. I have not been back. Um, but I know that uh, region of Abruzzo is known for its ironworking. Sulmona is a very, very well known for its ironworking. And the copper tradition throughout Abruzzo is also very well known. Um, the women used to carry water uh, with a conca, right? These sort of the beveled uh, copper pots that they would carry water. So yeah, it is, that whole area is very known for its artisanal work. You know, I, well, I know in a lot of Abruzzese went to the Pennsylvania, Philadelphia area. I know those of us in New York, there's not a kind of very um, I, I would say there's not a very strong Abruzzese presence, even though there are some. But in Philadelphia and the greater Philadelphia region, it's it, for me as a New Yorker, I'm always pleasantly surprised by it. And also, my father was from Abruzzo. So oh, I didn't another, know that. That's cool. Another region, yeah. What, another uh, reason. what town was he from? He's from a small town called Caruncchio which is in the province of Chieti as well. It's very close to the Molise border. Now with the uh, sort of modern roads, it's, it's probably like a half an hour drive. It would have taken much longer through the mountains. Yes. Both our, your grandfather and my father's time. Yes. Uh, his education and his training and his time in Italy. Let's talk a little bit about his, his before he comes to the United States. Here's some like these stories that the parent, my parents, my mother and my grandmother and my aunt would talk about. And they were always kind of weird and, and inexplicable. And one of them was, you know, my, my uh, grandfather was drafted and went and fought in the First World War. Um, and he, one of the stories was, he was a pacifist, but also he didn't like the rations, which was rice. So I guess the more north you go, the more rice you eat as opposed to pasta. Um, so it was this sort of thing like he wanted to get out of the, it's almost like they made a joke out of it. He wanted to get out of the army because he didn't want to eat rice. And the story is, he feigned, um, he feigned uh, sleepwalking. So he would get up in the middle of the night and walk around and pretend he was like going to fall off, a, you know, um, down the stairs or something. So to keep him from hurting himself, they sent him home. And then they sent a spy to Guardia Grele to make sure that he actually did sleepwalk. But then the war was over, so he didn't get redrafted. 
Great. <laughs> he was outspoken. He was left, definitely left of center. When I knew him, he was so much older and I grew up in the kind of family where my parents, when they didn't want us to know what they were talking about, they'd speak Italian, you know? So my Italian came pretty late, like I studied in high school and, um, and there are things that I picked up, but, uh, you know, I just think we're of a similar generation where perhaps there's the, like, you know, they wanted to assimilate and their kids were very much like Americans, but, you know, we always retained this, you know, the Italianness. Um, so, so when he was in uh, Abruzzo, he was a carriage maker. There was a mail truck that went between like Pescara and Chieti, and my grandfather built that mail truck, and that meant a whole lot to them. He was born in uh, 1891. So in the early 20s, he was, you know, a grown man. He married my grandmother, who was, I want to say she was 14 years younger than him. When they, I believe they were married in the late, mid-late 20s. By then, fascism was on the rise. He was an outspoken anti-fascist. There were stories around how he published what my grandmother, my mother called bathroom verse, anti-Mussolini verse in the local paper. From what I understand, he and his brother had like the biggest house in their small town or on that street or something like that. But the fascists seized his house and they immigrated and they went, they wanted to come to the US but they couldn't get passage. So this is after the the Johnson Reed Act of 1924. Right. So they went down, they went to Brazil. Um, so my mother was born in Brazil in 1928. My grandfather was also like, he was an inventor. He was always tinkering and making things. And apparently um, the coffee market was really in clover then. And he invented something called a coffee fresher, which is some way of harvesting the beans. I'm not exactly sure. When I look at it, I'm thinking, is this really it, or is this something else that he copied? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. But the story goes that he built and invented this coffee fresher with a partner. Um, the partner stole the patent, patented it under his name, and my grandfather was furious, and then the Brazilian coffee market fell anyway, so there was no money to be made in coffee any longer. My mother and my grandmother came to the U.S. ahead of him, I want to say like a year or two. They were relatives in Cliffside Park, New Jersey. My mother actually came in through Ellis Island when she was a little girl, which is kind of crazy to believe. I didn't know that until maybe the 90s and she was visiting me here and we went, my sister and I went to Ellis Island with her and she said, oh girls, I think, I think this is where we came in. <laughs> You've said so much and we haven't even gotten to his fantastic his artwork and it's great i mean one of the things that's important i think uh, for us to constantly remember was the role of fascism and anti-fascism and the, i had read that he had published these satirical poems is the way wikipedia lists them there's no you you have no record of those right i wish i did or the publication that they were published in yeah i don't and of course you know as you said the johnson reed act that uh, created uh, that imposed quotas on uh, european migration um, in particular southern and eastern european migration and really um, had an effect on uh, italian migration stifling it to in a significant degree. Um, and it wasn't until the 1965 uh, immigration law that that changed and with a lot of work by Italian Americans to uh, make that change as well as many others. Um, it's curious that they went to Brazil, right? So we, we understand that Italian migration is not just this kind of one directional Italy to the United States, but Italians had all these options that they were tapping into. Yes. And so to escape fascism um you know he understood they understood your grandparents that brazil was a place that they could that they that they had connections to there were a lot of italians who had already migrated to brazil you know i'm not even sure why they chose it that's one of those stories that got lost to history there was a third brother apparently who stayed behind in abruzzo and that was a split because that means like he was willing to get with the fascist regime if he didn't leave so so that 
side of the family, I guess, continued on, but there's not been a lot of truck between them. And the other thing that you mentioned was this large house. I mean, you know, given the fact that he was a, an artisan, you know, he wasn't a, a peasant who was working in the fields, meant that he had some stature, right, in, in a town, a small town. Yeah. A colleague of ours, David Aliano, he's written about um, the Italian migration to Brazil. They were really used, Italians were really used to supplement um, the recently freed slaves, and they were really exploited in, in Brazil. And a lot of, from what I understand, Italian migrants um, tended to leave Brazil and go to other places like Argentina because the working conditions were really horrendous, really horrendous. And so, as I said, our understanding of Italians, Italians, Italian immigrants being sort of anti-fascist is an, an important one always to keep in mind because we, um, I think there's this kind of uh, narrative of um, Italian immigrants not being sort of, yeah, not being involved in politics and not being involved in sort of anti-fascist politics. Do you know if he did anything once he came here in, ter in terms of uh, um, sort of being involved in any kind of anti-fascist activities? You know, I've never even asked myself that question. I don't know. My grandmother was very religious and he was an atheist, I believe, and my mother would tell stories about how she would have to sneak off to church when she was a little girl because my grandfather didn't want her going to church because it was like, you know, you're, you're being uh, brainwashed. I think this is wonderful, just sort of, you know, getting to learn about, um, you know, one individual, right? And that family's history. It reveals so much of uh, the diversity of Italian American experience. I think we all too often, there's this kind of very strict, normative, squared off understanding of what Italian American, what the Italian American experience has been. But we know that the exp Italian American experience has been plural, yes. right? right? There are many experiences and this seems clearly one of them. Um, how did they end up in Kenneth Square? My grandfather, when they first came, they were in, in Cliffside Park, New Jersey. He was, I think, doing carpentry work, something like that. And they would go, they'd have gigs, you know, within driving distance. And when he went somewhere outside of Kenneth, it reminded him of Abruzzo, something about the landscape. So he moved there. I think the house existed and then they built, he built the garage next door to it. Um, then what happened was other immigrants who had come in, they'd be like, here, come to, come to Kennet. So a lot of, just what you were saying, a lot of, a lot of Abruzzese live around, you move there and stayed there. You will go, you'll see um, street names uh, that sound like, that are really obscure little towns in Abruzzo named in these, <sighs> you know, these kind of like blank uh, Pennsylvania landscapes that are kind of like, what, how did that happen? So there's a picture of him building a garage, and that was his auto body shop, and also where his atelier, where he painted, and where he built the Encyclopedic Palace after he retired. So he had a, a picture framing uh, shop, and this was really sweet because I don't think anybody bought these picture frames. I was born in 1968, and he died in 1980, so my first 12 years, um, when we'd visit the house, you know, we'd go and have the kind of like, um, my, 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 uh, my, my grandfather was, was uh, pretty reticent and he had a kind of a, almost like a haunted quality. You know, he, he was sweet, but he was not as that engaged. He seemed like a dreamer. I feel like my, that's how the family, they're all dreamers. You know, <laughs> we inherited some of that. Um, but we would go next door to this beautiful garage and it had this cool, one of the panels in the doors, these, these huge, you know, wooden garage doors, you could push a panel in it, it was a trick door, and you'd step through it. It was like, you know, the line, the witch in the wardrobe it was really, really cool to a little kid. And inside, I can still see it, I can smell it. There, there was a wall of his paintings that he copied from old masters and things ripped out of National Geographic magazine. You sort of walk down this wall of paintings and to, to the side of that was his his atelier where he painted and where he had his architecture books. He had a huge roll top desk, beautiful, massive thing. And, you know, uh, maybe three, three um, shelves of big, thick old architecture books in Italian and some in English. And that's where he planned everything, I believe. And then going back out into the main garage in the corner was the Encyclopedic Palace. And it was under this beautiful, 
vitrine that he built um, made of panels and I, I'm trying to remember, I, I don't know if it, in my mind it was brass, but it was probably not brass, probably some kind of metal holding them together. And it was like, you know, it was like a little mini museum in the corner of the garage. Tell us all about it, because it's, it's a wonderful work. It's really, it's kind of a mashup in a lot of ways. I want to say it's eight cylinders. It's sort of a, a rounded, the central structure is uh, stacked like a wedding cake. And it, it has a kind of modernist, like almost like a sleek international style quality. And the model was, I believe, 11 feet tall, if you counted this uh, copper spire that was on top of it. Around it is a uh, like a four gardens and a balustrade with four domed uh, cupolas on each corner, and there's a whole system in his statement of purpose. He has like all these numbers about how many statues, like 144 statues here and this and that. Um, so they'd be statesmen, artists, writers um, enshrined in statues across on uh, across the top of the balustrade, um, and then four entrances in, and each one would say uh, Palazzo in Ciclipetico, you know, in, in four different languages. And it was really very broad. It was English, French, Italian, and Spanish. So yeah, it's really, cast your net wide. At any rate, um, and then across in the frieze along, uh, along the uh, col colonnade um, were motifs like, um, you know, about how to live well, how to live rightly. Um, not go to war, um, not, you know, be diligent, things like that, that were like uh, maxims. So, as you said, this was a model. He envisioned this to be built, right? This was, this was what he had hoped for. Yes, and he patented it because of his experience in Brazil, I think, you know. Ah. He was like, oh, no, no, no one's going to be me to patent now, which is absurd, of course. And I believe he wrote to, to whoever the president was and said, you know, I would like to build this on the, on the mall in Washington, D.C., um, and what's cool is, you know, that that was a parcel that wasn't used, and now that's the um, African American History Museum where that parcel ah, is part that of the parcel. Ah, yeah, wow. That uh, David, wow, I want to say wow. it's David Adche building, the cool, that's cool right, building. That's right. It says here uh, what he wrote was he envisioned this um, uh, encyclopedic uh, palace as ent an entirely new concept in museums, designed to hold all the works of man in whatever field all discoveries made and those that may follow, everything from the wheel to the satellite. When he passed in 1980, my grandmother had to, you know, they, they had to close the house and she moved up, moved to Wilmington, which is where I grew up in Delaware, to like an old folks high rise and they sold the house and the models, there was actually another model of a, a cathedral, which is almost like what he did as a warm up to build the encyclopedic palace the hat and the encyclopedic palace were disassembled and they went into storage. My mother wanted to give them away or do something with them so people could see them. And she wrote all these letters to every last museum and people were really mean to her. <laughs> like, what is this weird thing? Why would anybody want this? Like, it was rare to find that kind of appreciation for self-taught artists. Right. So. It was in storage for 22 years. It was in storage wow. from 1980 until 2002. Um, and it was always in the back of my mind, like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do about the Encyclopedic Palace? Like, you know, I felt like an onus on me, like I have to do something like, at some point when I started working as a proposal writer in architecture, and I've always loved architecture, I thought, you know, look, BG, like, if you don't do this, you know, nobody's gonna do this. So like, you know, get your butt in order here, so. It was right after the Folk Art Museum had opened, the beautiful now gone Folk Art Museum. Yeah, yeah. yeah. heartbreaking. Um, and I remember I was talking to an architect I worked with. She told me about this Empire State Building made out of these like little wooden toggles that's at the Folk Art Museum. Oh, yes, yes, yes. She was telling me about that and I thought, huh, well, you know, if they'd go for that, maybe. 
And um, so I go to the Folk Art Museum and they say, like, start on the top floor and work your way down. So you, you're moving uh, chronologically and you go to the top floor and it's all that, like, it's great old stuff. Yeah. It's lovely, but it didn't seem remotely ethnic. So I thought, oh, geez, like, this is not the place. But as I started to go down through the museum, I was like, oh, this is getting more intriguing and more interesting. And then when I saw that painting by Ralph Fazanella of yeah. his his father uh, crucified, who was an ice man, crucified on an ice pick. And I thought, oh my God, like, yeah, this is, this is where this has to live. So I wrote a letter to the person um, at the Folk Art Museum and put together like a press kit of pictures and um, old clippings from like the 50s and the 70s. And they were like, we're really interested. And then they're like, can we go get it? So the, the movers, the, the uh, a curator, and I don't remember this woman's name, she was really terrific. She and two movers come down and were taking the pieces of the encyclopedic palace and loading them up. She had like a little baggie. And so there's like something like a thousand or 800 windows that are little pieces of clear plastic of the 50s era. So he had drawn these little mullions on them, these tiny, tiny things, tiny, tiny windows. And so the movers are putting this stuff in the truck and little pieces of window are, are dropping off and she's like very carefully picking them up and putting them Great. in the Great. Ziploc bags. And Pooja and I looked at each other like, wow, like it was like, I was like, oh, these people are treasuring this thing. Like they know what it, they know what it is. Right. So yeah, it was, it. it was lovely. Yeah, it was lovely. Yeah. I mean, I saw it for the first time at the Folk Art Museum's Annex, across the street from Lincoln Center, and it had this incredible prominent place in the sort of second tier of the Annex, and it was, it was so exhilarating to see it, you know, I had read a little bit about it, but there it was, and it, it, it you know, it's a model, right? But it's monumental and it's and it's small scale down size. It it really is overpowering, and it, it's um, lovely to kind of get into to get lost in, into it. Because like with many miniatures, right? You kind of um, you kind of mentally transpose yourself into the miniature space. You kind of imagine yourself walking around or going inside and, or in, you know, looking up something in this encyclopedic palace. It was a real delight to see. It was a real delight to see. I mean, you know, so here it is from this, right? It's, it's in this garage in, in Kennett Square in Pennsylvania, gets to New York City, and then it makes its way to Venice. Yeah, that was, that was crazy because the Folk Art Museum started to um, lose so much money that they had to consider shutting down before mm. before the building finally came down. Um, and the annex was still there. They'd never got rid of that at Lincoln right. uh, Center, thank goodness, you know. And when I found out that it was the building was closing, I thought, oh my gosh, where'd it go? Where's the Encyclopedic Palace? I knew they had like a storage place in Queens and I thought, oh my gosh, it's going to get buried in storage again for another 22 years? Like, well, at least had its moment in the sun, you know, people got to see it, it's, it's, it's cared for now, you know. And then I get an email from Stacey Hollanders from the Folk Art Museum saying, there's a chance that the Encyclopedic Palace might be going to the Venice Biennale. And it was sort of like, what? <laughs> you know, what do you mean? It was wonderful to, you know, go to Venice. I hadn't been there. You went? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Cool. It was cool, it was so lovely just to get off the, um, to step out of the station and the first thing you see is like a kiosk and it says, you know, the Encyclopedic Palace and it's about the show but it's this name that's been in my head for a million years and it felt like this private thing that was everywhere. So we're going on the, on the Vaporetto and we're passing under these banners that say Encyclopedic Palace and it was like, wow, this is amazing. I think you know this story is so important for a number of reasons because um, I think there has been an underappreciation for these vernacular arts from within the Italian American community. One thing I wanted to show you is yeah yeah okay so check this out I don't know if you can see this see this can you see this yes well, I can is, it's a little footstool footstool that my grandfather built out of scrap wood so he Lovely. was always just like stuff is laying around, make something utilitarian, you know? Right, and it has, of course, right. the handle, the carrying handle, and that, right. that green that Italians love. 
the Folk Art Museum just put the Encyclopedic Palace back up in February after it had traveled around for several years. I was like, oh great, now everybody can see it. And then of course the city shuts down, so it's right. kind of like harder. Right, well, I mean, the great thing is not only has the art world come to an understanding and an appreciation for um, these types of artists and, and, and their works, but also that um, uh, Marino um, Auriti's um, encyclopedic palace has found a safe haven and a permanent place for all of us to enjoy. And um, for those of us in New York or those of us visiting New York, um, when this, um, when the city opens up and the museums open up, we can all go and, and visit his, um, his, his amazing work again. Yeah. So I wanna thank you, BG, so much for sharing all these things um, with us um, about your grandfather's uh, fantastical work. And um, thank you so much. Thank you, the pleasure is all mine. Thanks for watching this episode of Italics. I'm Anthony Tamburri. Arrivederci alla prossima puntata. Bye.